The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and Freedomslips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, Freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, for another edition of Cosmic Catastrophe on Revolution.Radio. I am your host, Diamond, from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, and my lovely co-host, Leah Shaper, is joining us tonight. Hello. Welcome to the show. We have, we're going to be talking about a lot of interesting topics, uh, a few of which you're unaware of. <clears throat> you probably saw that Willie Soon mm-hmm. just sent us out. His, yeah. <laughs> Willie soon just sent us out uh, his newest paper. Did you get that? I did get it, but I didn't read it yet. Yeah, we're going to talk about that briefly. Also, the Facts Matter Conference, which is an international conference on pandemics and government control, is happening right now Mm -hmm. as we're doing this. It is an all-day event. It's free. It's being live streamed. We'll give you the details on that. Also, we're going to briefly talk about a Harvard professor that found metallic spheres on the bottom of the Pacific that he claims are of interstellar origin. And many people are claiming aliens here, which is completely insane. That's, that's just silly. There's no reason to do that. No, not none whatsoever, especially when there are these microscopic microspherules of metal. It's like, right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Definitely a spaceship. We, we, (laughs) we tend to find those on earth. They do indicate something yeah, we, cosmic, but it doesn't need to be alien. Anyway, we'll get there. Well, an alien asteroid, maybe. Sure. <laughs> something yeah. that do, is okay. not already on Earth, yes, in that sense. And and the extra, the interstellar nature, me, uh, what they found was that the the alloy of the metal was of such that it does not exist in our solar system. So this yeah. object had to come from a different solar system. That is probably the most interesting part, right? Because you can probably just presume that um, we're more likely to find material that is from inside our solar system and that there'll be less and less of material from outside our solar system. Uh, uh, You you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And we've talked about how potentially it's these interstellar objects that bring life here to our Mm -hmm. solar system. Mm Mm-hmm. We're going to fi- uh, finish up on the main topic of the discussion, probably in the second half. We might get to it at the end of the first half here, which is a new paper coming out suggesting that there is a new genetic bottleneck they discovered so severe that there was only about twelve or 1,300 mating pairs at the time. And interestingly enough, it coincides with some of the largest magnetic reversals in recent history. So that's pretty interesting. It is. And I will also throw out there that it is possible that it does not coincide, but we'll get there. Yeah, that's a the data is limited, we shall say. <laughs> yeah, and, and the dating is always difficult, of course. So let's start with the Facts Matter conference that's happening now and is revealing the facts about pandemics and government control. It is a one-day international conference in Copenhagen, Denmark. Today is the day. All you have to do is go to factsmatterconference.com. One word, factsmatterconference.com. Click on the live stream link, and you're going to hear from the likes of Dr. Peter McCullough, John Campbell. These are people that many of you know the names about, Dolores Cahill, Reiner Fulmich, and many others that are going to be talking about what's actually happening on Earth, which is good news because facts do matter. Do you know, is there like a replay of the conference that you can buy? There must be, and it'll probably take a day to get. It's free. No, they're gonna they're gonna let it out for free. The replay probably when the live stream ends. It's all yeah. day, so just click in and join. Cool. Now jumping over to the Saris Science website here. This is Willie Soon's um, scientific group. I believe he is the head of it. So if you want to fund his science, you can always go to Saris Science here and click on one of the links and support us right at the top here. He's always emailing us his newest studies. Soon, Willie Soon is one of the most published scientists on Earth. He publishes around 
between 150 and 300 papers a year, I think. That, that's insane. That's, <laughs> that's one crazy. a day. <laughs> like, who has time for that? <laughs> Most of his studies are like this one where there's literally 32 scientists working on a topic for a year and they're all putting a little piece in and then boom, it gets published. Right. But in this most well, recent and, and paper, don't forget, you always have like grad students to help you write papers and stuff like that. So there's that. Yeah. 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 But none of these people are all independents. Very few of them are coming from academia, which is right. why a lot of people are against what they say because they don't follow the current political narrative. Right. Which makes the uh, proliferation of all of these papers even more impressive, right? Because if that's the case, if everybody's institu not institutionally affiliated, you have fewer grad students to lean on. Right. And this paper, um, uh, amazingly, open access got published in the Journal of Climate. So that's that means wow. that, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Now, real briefly, the study published in Climate, which is uh, a peer-reviewed scientific journal on the topic, has 37 re researchers from 18 countries. The study suggests that solar activity estimates considered by the IPCC are incorrect and too low when it comes to actual effects on Earth. And they also point out a very glaring problem. Now, it's well known that cities are warmer than the surrounding countryside. But urban areas only account for less than 4% of the global land surface. 4%. The problem is 90% of all temperature stations are in these locations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely on purpose. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the IPCC is claiming that 10% of the warming is urban warming. And in this study, they found that an astonishing 40% of all global warming that's being attributed to man since 1850 is from urban heat island effect and not from warming. Mm-hmm. Big Lo problem. and behold, <laughs> I mean, just like you said, I mean, that, that should be fairly evident just based on the location of these temperature monitor monitoring stations. We run into the same problem often with temperature monitoring stations that are at airports next to runways. I mean, that's completely crazy. <laughs> runways are really hot. And they're paying. Yeah, and there's um, Jen, Jennifer Morahasi uh, out of Australia. She went and did a study in Australia, I believe, on those stations. Uh, she found some of the original stations were where they should be, you know, in rural areas, not near buildings, etc. But she also found a statistical manipulation of the position of the ones that are in urban areas. They're being put in further and further into the center of parking lots or tarmacs where it is clearly hotter than the position they were before. And mm -hmm. some have suggested that this is a nefarious thing that's being done to get government funding because you, what you can prove easily is like extreme warning, warming by simply moving the station to get warmer temperatures when the actual temperature isn't warming. It's completely insane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's such a simple so, manipulation too. And it's, it's mine. Well, it's not mind boggling, but, but it's pretty astounding to think about how many, how many of the general populace wouldn't know that. Right. And how many of the studies, probably all of them, are reflected with these types of poor datas, data yeah. sets? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what's basically going on with climate science. And there is a team, at least of 34 scientists worldwide here at 18 different uh, facilities that are actually doing good science and trying to correct the record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so thank we'll you leave you links to, to the paper. Good scientists. Yeah, we'll leave you links to the paper so you can peruse it yourself because typically these things cost money. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the interstellar metal found on the bottom of the Pacific. Here's a couple of things that I have a problem with. They drug these magnetic sleds across the abyssal plain in the bottom of the Pacific, you know, Claim, claiming that they were in an area where maybe an object of interstellar origin hit, and so they were trying to recover some of this material. I mean, that was the premise. Mm -hmm. Now, the odds of you actually finding the spot of impact and then the material on the bottom of the Pacific is almost zero. So whatever metallic spheres they're pulling up here, in my opinion, could be from any origin, from any interstellar object at any time in the past. 
Uh, so just based on that alone, I think that it's a, it's a bad place to start with a study. Are, are you saying because we basically don't have any sort of in situ information because it's in the ocean, right? We have water in currents, so things move around. Is that basically what yeah, you're this, suggesting? This could have been from any comet at any time. Right, right, right. Like it could have it could have eroded off the land into the ocean. Yeah. It could have come from some other part of the ocean. You can't do stratigraphy with this. Yeah. So so great. They found some interstellar metal balls. If you look at any <laughs> of the studies from the Younger Dryas, guess what they find? The same, <laughs> the same types of metals, the same types yeah. of spheres with exotic yeah. metals that are not from this solar system. Yeah. Yeah. So Clearly, this isn't a breakthrough of any kind. It's it's more, I think, the media using science to get great headlines, and it's clickbait. Yeah. I mean, now, maybe what would be interesting, perhaps, if you could do an analysis, if you take all the microspherals you find and then do an analysis on their composition. You know, we find this type of composition and this type of composition, and maybe you could do some analysis with that as far as where the material might have come from. But... Beyond that, like this is not uncommon to find these. Right. And here's the sleds. There's a picture, uh, those listening on radio, you can watch later tonight on our YouTube channel, Magnetic Reversal News at 8 p.m. So these are the sleds they used. And literally, look, they've got flashlights. They're just looking here for, for little balls of metal. I mean, if I took a high power magnet and went outside and just ran around the grass, I would get thousands of different pieces of metal stuck to that magnet. Yeah. Yeah, there would be no way I could tell where where it came from or how it got there. Yeah, <laughs> except yeah. I would know that it's from there. You know, the other funny thing about I don't know if it was this article or an article on the same topic, some published somewhere else, but they were maybe it was they were talking about comets and about how their their movement is kind of mysterious. You know, some comet that's whose movement is sort of mysterious because you know, it accelerates when it approaches the sun and we can't explain that. Whereas they basically alluded to how electric universe theory can explain it. It's very funny. Like as if yeah, it's so some big revelation or something, which we it's are not. We talking about um, the miraculous um, and at the time groundbreaking arrival of a Muamua. I'm trying to get the date. 2017 is when the comet Muamua was first discovered, and when we checked the traje trajectory, it was clearly coming from outside of the solar system at a very mm -hmm. high rate of speed, and it was traveling directly towards our sun. <clears throat> so when it went around the sun, it performed a maneuver never seen by an object. It accelerated. Now, this is not unique or unknown. This is how we move spaceships around. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we would yes, flash yes. them around objects in our solar system to give them new tra trajectories and to get them to places. We literally use planets as I don't I, what's the word like a slingshot. Like a slingshot is yes, the idea. that's the word. Right. It's like a gravitational so, slingshot. So when we see a giant interstellar comet do that around the sun, why is that? Why does that blow our mind? I don't get it. Mm hmm. Well, they also, but they also reference, um, I think, like the the emissions of some sort of hydrogen compound or something off of the comet, which may be playing a role in the movement, which is part of the discharging because of the interaction with the sun. Yeah. So, what if it's a magnetic body, and then this interaction, the the ionization or outgassing of the hydrogen, causes a magnetic change and a repulsive effect on the right. sun. And it literally right. shoots away like a magnet. Right, right. So they kind of allude to that as if it's some like brand new discovery or something. But we know from electric universe theory that it is not in any way a brand new discovery. And all the authors of this silly article had to do was do five minutes of research with EU. But anyway. And so it all comes from this paper, uh, 2022, November 1st, a meteor of apparent interstellar origin in the CNEOS fireball catalog. And they're talking again here about Oumuamua, its interstellar origin. Uh, and I don't think they get into aliens here. So we'll link you this paper below. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people have speculated, including Avi Loeb, the Harvard professor himself, that Oumuamua may be a starship. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> clearly, 
cloaked to be to look like a meteor. <laughs> How embarrassing. Yeah, like it's a Klingon ship or something. <laughs> well, again, it's it's specifically embarrassing because there is literally no reason to hypothesize that this comet is some kind of spaceship. Because we've seen the result, let's say, microspherals that are not from this planet on Earth. We've seen that before from uh, objects outside of us. So there's no reason to do that. It's so silly. Yeah, these microspherials typically come from huge cometary airbursts. When large objects come in, break apart into thousands, if not millions of pieces, and then literally wreak havoc on the surface of the Earth through electrical discharge. It mm -hmm. is only these types of electrical discharges with plasma that can create the conditions necessary to melt uh, these things and to create the microspherules, the tectite glass, and all the other associated impact type um, proxies that we look for, like platinum spikes and this right. and that and the third. Right. And what's interesting, and we're about to get into it, is the whole rest of this podcast is going to be about cosmic catastrophe in one way or another. <laughs> because what we've uncovered uh, doing this podcast uh, for months and months now early on uh, was that things like magnetic excursions cause mass extinctions. We have a very famous paper, um, which gives us this data set here, uh, late quaternary geomagnetic something, I don't remember the title, but it, mm. it shows the phylogeny of hominids are directly affected to the magnetic field strength on Earth. So what, what I mean by that is we have these breakaway groups of hominids at low field strength. Here is this is called the Blake magnetic excursion. Boom, we've got this whole group of hominids emerging. The mm -hmm. Neanderthal extinction occurs at a bottom point, a deep magnetic excursion, one of the lowest in hundreds of thousands of years. And that's when you know Cro-Magnon took over. Mm -hmm. So there is a direct connection through scientific analysis and anthropology and stratigraphy as using the magnetic field to show that things like evolution and extinction occur at low field strength. Mm -hmm. And this paper coming out amazingly says that there was a bottleneck somewhere around 800,000 years ago, which just happens to coincide with the deepest magnetic excursion in 800,000 years, which is actually a magnetic reversal called mm -hmm. the Brunus Matoyama. Now, the data set is hard to find to go earlier than this, but I found it. <clears throat> and it shows that for the entire period of this bottleneck, from about 1.2 million to 800,000 years ago, we the Earth was literally living in magnetic reversal hell, yeah. where the field strength was below the Lechamp threshold for the whole time, one, two, three, four, five times. And so this is what we know, very bad conditions for the biome on Earth. Well, not to mention that you've got the magnetic field strength bouncing around all over the place here in this time yeah, frame. Yeah, watch. It goes it goes like deeper than ever and then look all the yeah. way up and then straight yeah. back down. Yeah. And then for this extended period, this is like the longest, deepest excursion I've seen unless you go back millions of years. And this is right at the point of that bottleneck Literally, 910 to 880 or whatever that is. I got uh, like the, the biggest reduction, according to this paper, would have been around 930. Yeah, That's so here is their data set. And I like yeah. this because they give good context. I don't, this, are you, pro did you find this graphic? No, is that in like the, the. Um, Supplement. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was going to look at that, but I didn't have time. Yeah. So this shows you the pro the problem that they all everyone knew about. Anthropologists all know that between around six hundred and thirty thousand years ago to about a million years ago, the fossil record for hominids is bleak. There's just very yeah. few fragments, especially in Africa, where most of the people were supposed to be living. There's like this point in time in Africa where all these skulls are being found in caves that they just don't have any, a lot of evidence of hominids. Mm -hmm. And it's the same time when Homo erectus goes extinct and Homo heidelbergensis emerges, which is a, very similar to the Le Champ where mm -hmm. Neanderthal goes extinct and Cro-Magnon becomes uh, king, so to speak. 
Yeah. Another thing I want you to note up here is that this is the ice core data that's going all the way back 1.2 million years. The typical ice core graph you see ends right here at 400,000. And you can see the 100,000 year cycles go all the way back. And interestingly enough here, at the beginning of the bottleneck and for about 100,000 years, there is a ice age cycle that does not have an interstadial. This high point is still 10 degrees below where it would actually be warm on earth. Mm -hmm. So there was never a warm time here where look, there's a warm time before and after, but not in here for hun over a hundred thousand years. So yeah. that had to be a brutal time on earth. Yeah. Yeah. This also looks like, uh, and I can't really quite tell, but it looks like this is the beginning of that sort of hundred thousand year periodicity. Yeah, exactly. The big, uh, yes. Yeah. Because right? before that it was 40,000, 41,000. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's so a major shift happens at the Brunus Matayama magnetic reversal where we go from a 41,000 year ice age to a 100,000 year ice age. And the first one never had an interstadial. So it was literally, this has got to be the coldest ice age out of 1.2 million years. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so that is more supporting evidence on why there could be a pop population bottleneck here. Absolutely. Yeah. Now you took a deep dive into the paper, did you not? Yeah, um, I didn't have quite as much time to digest it as I had hoped, but um, and this is a you know, this paper is heavily um, geno let's say genomics based and also mathematical modeling based. Neither of which I have any particularly good knowledge about. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I I take issue with some of it. So to begin with, what they did is they took. Um, some present day human genome sequences. They used 3,514 sequences, which in reality is not very much, right? Like, I guess, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I assume that basically means the genomic sequences of 3,514 individuals. Um, That's what it says. It's actually 3,154 individuals. Oh, did I reverse the numbers? Well, in any case, um, so if you, um, there's 8 billion people on the planet currently. So that is 0.00003925% of the current population. So I'm a little skeptical just based on that. Like that's not much genetic material to be determining what was happening 800,000 years ago. So there's that. Um, but well, here, so that, here on this, let, let's just go to the population density that they're discussing because yeah. they do have a graphic of that. And okay. so what they're claiming is that based on the genomic data prior to this bottleneck, there's evidence that the earth only had about 100,000 hominids on it. Mm -hmm. that, that seems ridiculously low. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that number alone, I think, is ridiculously low. Um, and then it shrinks down in the bottleneck to 27,000 individuals which is just yeah. a, is a reduction of three quarters. Right. And then it blows back up. Um, but well, during this bottleneck, it's saying that it, it dropped to as few as 1,280. So from 100,000 well, to 1,000, back up to 30,000. Okay, so but, but let's be specific here because the 1,280 individuals that were supposedly the bottom of the bottleneck, that is only from the African population. So with these with these sequences, they, yes. the, the sequences are from 10 African populations and 40 non-African populations. So they found a very strong signal in the African populations of a severe bottleneck, but the signal for that in the non-African populations is very weak. So then they ran another more intensive model and said, oh, look, we found it. See, there was a bottleneck in the non-African populations as well. So I'm, I'm a little... I don't know. I'm, I'm a little skeptical. I'm not saying that that there's not useful information in here and that they may be onto something, but I I do have a lot of questions about the the how they how they got here. And my the other thing that bothers me is, you know, using the the genome sequences from African populations. Okay, that that seems pretty reasonable. But when you say non-African populations. Since we're talking about a period of time where populations may have been heavily affected by climactic change, 
that it would seem to me to make sense to use um, population groups that are more specific than non-African, right? Because climactic effects can change from various parts of the world. So non-African is like as about as non-specific as you can get. Like, I wonder if they would have gotten better information if they had used specific ethnicities or uh, sequences that would suggest they're from particular parts of the globe. Yeah, and we'll get to that after the break. So stay tuned. We're going to talk about Australian Australian You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. Who owns you? If you're not in control, then someone else is. Join me, Ivy West, for Voices on the Wind, Saturday. I discuss government, health, metaphysics, suppressed science, universal mysteries, little-known incredible facts, alternative energies, and even more than you can imagine. Won't you join us on Revolution Radio Saturdays for Voices on the Wind with me, Ivy West. Because if your head's in the sand, your tail is a target. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution. 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 Radio! The Secret Kindergarten is here for the young children of the world. The best program on the radio for kids. Dealing with the most important topics in the whole universe. Fairy tales, music and movement, numbers, plants, animals, fun, colors, insects. Take care and cast your ears out to catch a story from the world of other young things. Reach out, up, under, and over. Sing a song. Talk about feelings. Just remember the magic word. The magic word is no. Step on into the secret kindergarten. Saturdays, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on Revolution Radio. Join me and the Brian Rue Show on Revolution Radio, Eastern Standard Time, every Tuesday night from 6 to 8. When we talk about the four most vital things, in my view, affecting all of humanity. Number one is UFOs and aliens and their agenda for the advancement of humanity. Number two is the Jewish establishment's control over all aspects of human civilization. Number three, the truth about Adolf Hitler, how he was the opposite of what we've been told. Number four is advanced ancient global civilizations. Join me on the Brian Rue Show, Tuesday nights from 6 to 8 on Studio B on Revolution Radio. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Any commercial advertising you may hear in this program is of the sole discretion and benefit of the host of whose program you are listening to. Revolution Radio does not endorse any commercial products, nor does it accept monetary compensation for on-air advertising of commercial products, nor will it ever. We are and shall remain 100% listeners supported. Any product advertising on this program are considered used at higher risk, and Revolution Radio shall not be held liable for any claims or damages received from any product advertised within this program. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps.
opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. And we're back with the second half of Cosmic Catastrophe. We're talking about a new paper that just came out that's suggesting there was a bottleneck with as little as 1,300 breeding pairs for maybe 100,000 years. Now, the Uh, problem... Go ahead. Let let me just uh, throw in there, too. So, because we were talking before the break about the non-African populations. Yeah, I want to get to that. Yeah, well, I'm just saying that it it, it would probably be about 3,000 individuals total. Okay. Now the problem with them using the not uh, with lumping every not into lumping the non-African groups is huge because we're talking about uh, European hominids that are we're now uncovering them in caves all over Europe that were around at this time. They were living a much harder life in an ice age. They're living at the edge of the glaciers up there while while people in Africa is probably warm and sunny. There are no very few glaciers in Africa, even at the right. peaks of these ice ages. Right. So the people trying to scrape by at the edge of the glaciers up in Europe or North America, wherever they're at, it's got it's a brutal life. So there's not going to be many of them to begin with. And yeah. who knows about uh populations in China or more equatorial areas, it's it's really bizarre that they lump the whole rest of the world in together. Yeah, I, I, I find that very strange. I suspect it has uh, something to do with the out of Africa dispersal hypothesis, um, but I haven't quite figured out what the, the link is to that thinking and how we get here in terms of grouping these populations into African and non-African. The, the problem is that you know, let's go back five decades ago, all the evidence of hominids was coming out of Africa with the work Mm -hmm. of Dr. Leakey and Lucy. We were pushing hominids back millions of years and the only places we found them were in Africa. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that there were only hominids in Africa two million years ago. It's ludicrous on it for a number of reasons because what we're finding now is more and more hominids that are very old from all over the world. Yeah. The problem is that there are almost no hominid fossils. Like people think we've got millions of fossils of people from long ago. There's like a piece of a finger or a toe or a fracture of a cranium. We don't have many fossils of hominids. They're very rare and we Mm -hmm. almost never find them because if you're living in a cave millions of years ago and you die, the odds of any of you being preserved is like zero. Yeah. Like, we don't find dead animals in the woods all the time. We find a few bones. They're all recent within a year or two from a fresh kill, and they don't yeah. last. They get completely consumed. It's very rare yeah. you get a hominid fossil. Right, right. That's the problem. Well, and then this this lumping of all of the non-African populations together, it may be, you know, if if, let's say, presuming that this mathematical modeling that they used to come to these conclusions about how many hominids were around, um, if the modeling is legitimate. Perhaps the signal for the non-African populations is so weak precisely because essentially of what you just said, right? Like, what, well, or because it's the whole, it's all of these different people potentially all grouped together in different parts of the globe. It's kind of bizarre. But when they do their extended analysis using their model, what they find is that um, for their bottleneck, it would have been approximately 1,450 individuals between 921,000 years ago and 785,000 years ago. So that's the other thing yep. about this. Whether we're talking about African group or the African group, the the period of time where there's few individuals is very long for non-African for African populations, it's 117,000 years, and it's even longer for the non-African populations. So even if the numbers aren't right in terms of the number of individuals, I think you could probably presume that, yes, there was a massive population reduction. Maybe these numbers aren't correct, 
But it also yeah. makes sense, like you said, because glaciation, and also we haven't even gotten there yet, but Australian stru stru uh, strewn fields and, well, and, and, and the reversal, perhaps. Yeah, some of the conclusions that I'm going to offer by the end of this half hour are pretty startling um, and could be very bad for humanity. So let's, let's, let's talk about what's going on. So the paper itself is suspect because of a number of things we talked about. The, the lack of actual fossils of hominids um, and things like that. And they're making these huge assumptions. And then they come up with these numbers like 1,240 people. It's like, come on, really? <clears throat> I think that they'd well, be it's better also, off you know, talking again, this in more, gen more general terms than, than giving us these suspect numbers. Yeah, and and it's it's kind of an issue that we've talked a lot about. Let's say in regards to climate change research, where we're using models, and in this case, they basically took their model and they compared it to a bunch of other models, and then they said, "Look, our model fits the best." So yeah. I mean, I mean, I I I sort of take issue with with that uh, that kind of research, but it's but you not can my see forte, here from so. this graph. So these little blue dots up here are locations where hominid fossils have been found. And you can see there's a huge gap here where there's nothing, just one location. Yeah. Prior to that, Which there was a little- Which this paper does acknowledge that lack of fossils in this time yeah. period, so yeah. that. But I think there's a good reason for it. First of all, like we explained, there was a massive shift in the ice age cycle from 40 to 100,000 years. So that's gonna, take those hominid populations and expose them for 100,000 years of hardship, where before it was only 40,000 and then it warmed up. Right, so, right. So that's right. the beginning. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the second thing that's happening here, um, starting at 900,000 years ago, all the way to 780, is the field strength on Earth is low the whole time. So for 100,000 years, what you're going to get is cosmic ray bombardment, which is yeah. going to strip the Earth of its ozone layer. There's going to be plants frying in the fields. People are going to get cancers. It's going to be hell on Earth for 100,000 years. So yeah. people are going to die off. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I want to raise about this, right, is that the, I don't even know how to pronounce it right, the Bruins? Bruins? My tongue? Bruness? Bruness? Yeah. Bruness. Brunhess. Brunhess. Oh, I've got it spelled Some wrong. people say Bruns, Mariama. Bruns. Yeah, actually, that makes sense because it's B-U-R-H-N-E-S. Anyway, Bruns, no, Matiyama. No, B-R-U-N-H-E-S. Do I have it misspelled? Okay. Um, yes. Anyway, the re I'll just call it the, the, the BM reversal right now. How about that? <laughs> it's the last reversal. Um, the only, la it's the last magnetic reversal on Earth. Yeah. Okay, so 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 if the reversal itself is seven hundred and eighty-one thousand years, that's more recent than this time period where we're talking about the genetic population reduction between nine thirty and eight thirteen. But yeah, this so, also, so but this also look, makes look at the graph here. Here's the here's the reversal, right? And it's the period it before all of this. Exactly. This is, this is cosmic this is, ray bombardment for like four hundred thousand years. So that's what I was going to say, right? So prior to any reversal happening, you're going to have a long period essentially of excursion where magnetically things are kind of chaotic on Earth. Well, so and look, it may look at this. Uh, there's actually magnetic reversals that happen one, two, three, four, five, six times. Yeah. Yeah. Reversal, so like you said, full reversal, six times right, right. while the population then, is dying off. Right, right. And and then you also have these, you know, within that, of course, you have these periods of extreme magnetic field weakness, which, like you said, is going to bring in a lot of cosmic rays, potentially introduce a lot of mutation, a lot of climate chaos, like who knows what's going on exactly here. So lo and behold, um, you know, if, if this should lead to a rever reversal, it's the period before that that is going to be extremely difficult for life on Earth. Right, and after the reversal, the VADM, which is the magnetic field strike, the VADM, stays mm -hmm. above the mass extinction threshold for um, almost a million years. So right. there's plenty of time for diversity and hominids to recover to bring us where we are today. Yeah. Now, the bad news is looking at this graph is this red line that for the last 400,000 years, the field strength has been systematically reducing back into the levels where these terrible things were happening.
Yeah. And if you can look over here on the most recent data set, the VADM, the VADM, the magnetic field strength, whatever you want to call it, is approaching five. The threshold is four where mass extinctions occur. So we're very close to the next magnetic excursion threshold of bad things and mass extinction on Earth. But there's also speciation, so we're going to get new things. I mean, do you think it's it would be fair to say that we're essentially in an excursion right now? Oh, we have been at least for 100 or 200 years. The general right. field strength has been dropping for thousands of years. Right, right. And I think that's an important element to realize in all of this, right? Because there's a lot of misconception about excursion and reversals. And clearly excursion, when the field strength gets really weak, takes a very, it can go on for a very long period of time. And a reversal is only going to happen if that, with the right variables, that the excursion gets really extreme, that the field is so weak that things can actually flip. But Based on all the data, the field doesn't flip unless you get down here to one. When you're right. below one, it can flip. But anything right. above that is just an excursion. It right. always right. flips back. So now, the, reversal the, Jamaica... is instant the reversal is essentially instantaneous, but the excursion is not in any way. But they are no, related like to each other. In J the Jamaica Pringle Falls excursion lasted for over 20,000 years right. on the way down right. and the way up. Right. right. And so, and the Lachamp lasted even longer on the way down and the way back up. Mm -hmm. And Neanderthals died halfway down, not at the bottom. It was getting so bad so rapidly they went extinct halfway down that line. Yeah. I believe I have the graphic. Yeah, here it is. <clears throat> this can put it into perspective. So here's the field strength dipping during that excursion. Here's the bottom of the Lachamp as it rises back up. And Neanderthals go extinct after this dip right here. Yeah. Boom, they're gone. And then it goes right. all the way down and Cro-Magnon somehow can make it through this because of, I think we talked about this, didn't we? Maybe there's some genetic predisposition to protect us from cosmic rays or something. Yeah. That made us get through it. Uh, I feel like there's something very specific too about Cro-Magnon in regard to that, but I don't remember now. I thought it was a protein or something that we were. were yeah, producing. something like that. Yeah, I've forgotten all about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so magnetic reversals and extinctions aren't necessarily bad, except for the animals living on the planet. They're not bad for the biome overall. It's no. a kind of a reset. It's yeah. a way to to get new things going and to refill ecological niches. And based you know, on, go ahead. I, it, this is just another thing that's rather interesting, right? So if this BM reversal happens at 781 um, and the the genetic bottleneck, according to this paper, the, re, the, the major reduction is 930, um, but recovery, I guess starts or has happened by 813. So even the recovery is pre pre what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Precessing, whatever, is before the reversal, according to this. Yes. yes. Probably in the midst can, of the excursion. You can see why here on this graph. So this is when the bottleneck occurs, when the field strength is low. And then mm -hmm. there is a period of about 100,000 years where it recovers. And that's when the recovery occurs. Yeah. Right before yeah, but, the reversal. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. But there's a well, long the period other... of field recovery here. See that for 100,000 years? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's this okay. long period of, of excursion that bottlenecks. It probably started back here. It probably started back 1.2 million. Yeah. And it lasted all the way through to about 900,000, 880, it recovered, and then 780 is the reversal. Yeah. But then also, interestingly, and I guess we'll get to this, but the Australian strewn field, right, is dated to like 788, 790? Yes. So shortly after the reversal, which is very interesting, because that's not the first time we see in geological history some kind of impact following a reversal. Like, what is the connection there? Is there one? No, well, granted, seven, they can be separated they, by they like 10,000 years, but... They put Brunus Mariama reversal, the down point here, at 780. Some yeah, put it at 781, right. Yeah. <laughs> so 788 oh, is, is before. Yeah, the impact is before. Sorry, I said it backwards, yes. So and either, what I think way. is happening here is uh, 
look at the drop down for the reversal. It's almost vertical in the beginning here. Yeah. So something huge happens on earth in a short period of time. And when this things like this occur, we suck in huge commentary bodies. That's, that's all I can, that's all I can right. think of. And it, it, still may it still may take 10,000 years, but, but maybe it's electromagnetic in some way. Yeah. Because the same thing is happening uh, with uh, the young Dryas event. The magnetic yeah. field weakens, and then all of a sudden we get bombarded with objects. Right. Or or maybe we're just failing to repel them in s somehow. Yeah, yeah, so that they're more likely to drop in instead of stay in their orbit. Right. Something could get tweaked in our solar system that causes bad things to happen. Well, And, and maybe <clears> we <throat> are attracting them too, right? Like if we consider that co comets are electric, right, and are going to respond to electromagnetics. I mean, and I'm not suggesting this is necessarily a comet, but given that, you know, it could be that our our electromagnetism in, in a state like that when we're in excursion or after a reversal is such that we are pulling that in. Either way. Yeah. And there's exceptional evidence that what we're pulling in are electric comets that break apart and discharge all over the earth. The, the yes. reason I say this is because of the tektite fields. Yes. A tektite is, is melt glass, which only can be formed from either nuclear explosions or plasma discharges from comets exploding above the surface. They yes. can occur from a single impact, but it would have to be gigantic and like melt the earth, kind of like the dinosaur impactor or maybe this, some of the bigger, go ahead. This impact would seem to be huge, right? Because the tektites cover 30% of earth, which is yeah, like equivalent to the entire land mass of earth. I mean, that's look huge. That. Yeah, absolutely so huge. They've been arguing for years about, uh, is it an impact? And in fact, a paper in 2019 used some uh, seismic studies and they found a crater. Nice. And the crater dates to 790,000 years ago, which is in the right time frame. Absolutely. Um, and it is estimated to be 15 kilometers in diameter. Wow. So, and it's buried underneath of a volcanic field in southern Laos. That's why we never found it. Huge amounts of lava covered it over. It wasn't until they did a seismic sur survey of the subsurface that they located this massive impact structure. Pretty Very interesting. interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> so we do have at least one 17 by 13 kilometer crater that is being, that is explaining the impact here and the strewn fields. I wonder if that, cr that crater size supports the strewn fields being as large as they are. Yeah. I mean, the dating appears don't. to be correct. So the impact is to, uh, is in Indochina up here to the north, and which is interesting. It kind of matches the. It, it means the object was coming from the North Pole south and hit. Yeah. And then it blows out in all directions here. Well, so that's also interesting because um, if if let's if the impact let's say had been coming from the other direction. Um, I mean, the 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 orientation the of the entire strewn... Asia and Africa would be covered with it, right? So the orientation of the strewn field is such that it's probably going to affect fewer people than if it were the other way around, which is interesting, um, considering that we have this you know human genetic bottleneck recovery happening around eight thirteen. So before this ever happens, so maybe that helps support the idea that that recovery was like well in process and was able to continue. Yeah, especially because this is where most of the people they're claiming are Africa, Europe, and the Fertile Crescent. Right, exactly. Unaffected. Yeah. But what right. if there were aboriginals here? They got wiped right. out. Anybody? Except they're still here. Yeah, but they're they're only supposed to be on in Australia for about eighty thousand years. Oh well, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah they're not that old. Know. Huh. So huh. maybe huge populations of hominids were wiped out by this event in right. the Australian continent. Right. It would be so interesting to do to do a similar, let's say, um, genetic sampling of 
Australian Aboriginals and sort of look at their time frame and if they had any bottlenecks and when that happened and all of that. That'd be interesting and compared it to this information. Yes. Which is exactly why I said earlier in this show that, um, I, you know, I take issue with this lumping together of all the non-African populations. I think you get a lot more interesting data if you looked at specific ethnicities and their geological, geographical correspondence. Yeah, I think there needs to be lots of genetic work. And with mm -hmm. the limited data we have, it's it's going to be a very long time before we probably have a good idea what's happening uh, in the last million years. We just don't know much. Yeah. But what did happen here is significant. We go from, um, where is it? Yeah, we go from Homo erectus to Homo Heidel heidelbergensis, and it's right at the strewn field time. Mm -hmm. So you've got this population bottleneck, things are getting bad, huge impact on earth, which shakes the earth, probably gets dark for a few years, or it's probably terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's literally uh, where hell on earth came from. And then a new species emerges on the other side, and there's no more erectus, just Heidelbergensis. Can Absolutely you imagine being... Can you imagine being part of like a group of like a few thousand people left on earth? And then like, I don't know, at some point your population starts recovering and then all of this happens. <laughs> and then boom, yes. like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I can't win here. Now it has been proposed. So we're not the ones proposing this, although I thought we were, but it has been proposed no. that the impact of this comet may have triggered the reversal. Mm hmm. I don't believe that because I don't either. And it doesn't, it, yeah, it doesn't make sense because they're separated by too long a time period, depending on how you date things. So let's say, you know, about 10,000 years. It, it, I found it very interesting too, that Wikipedia also makes reference to, um, a potential link between the, I don't know how to pronounce it. The Jaramillo reversal, Yaramillo yeah. reversal a million years ago. And the African Botswami impact event 1.07 million years ago. But so people have noticed that these things sort of one follows the other, but there's a there's a good amount of chunk of time in between them. It doesn't mean that they're not related, but it doesn't mean no, that, and I that think one is if the there is a relationship the other either. I think if there is a relationship, it's the reverse that the magnetic excursion encourages impacts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think we can definitively say that the um, impact doesn't trigger the reversal in the case of the BM reversal, for example, specifically because we can already see that the excursion leads up to the reversal, which I think has to happen. I don't think you're going to ever have uh, a magnetic reversal that isn't preceded by an excursion. You need the instability of the excursion to trigger the reversal. It's not going to just happen out of nowhere. Yeah, so in the last 500,000 years, there's been at least two dozen times where excursions did not result in reversals. Yeah. They just drop down to some point, and for some reason, blink, they just spring back up. And right. no one right. has an explanation why. I always think about it, it's kind of like a lava lamp in a way. I mean, not exactly, but it's like, okay, in strong magnetic field, your dipole is really strong, which means you have one pole of the Earth is strongly ch positively charged and the other pole is strongly negatively charged. And when we go into an excursion, things become more amorphous. It's less strong at the poles and we have these pockets of positive and negative that are a little bit more amorphous and they're interacting with each other and changing things. See, I don't think you can really, it, it's like a fluid dynamics thing. You can't, there's, I don't think you can predict exactly what the effect is going to be in the following 10 years. I think it, it's kind of of its own accord, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and this is mostly, we're all, we're just speculating here. There's very mm -hmm. little, take a look at the last 2.2 million years. There's very little pattern. You know, there's yeah. period, there is no regular periodicity to these excursions or reversals. Yeah. Which is interesting now, in and of itself. Yeah, maybe the spikes up and down could correspond to some of the smaller celestial mechanics, like mm -hmm. precession of the equinoxes. The sure. North Pole could be wobbling, and, it, it, and that's what kind of shifts the magnetic dipole. Sure. Well, and then you throw in other variables, like whatever is going on with our sun, right? Because when, yeah. the, when the sun's activity goes down, our magnetic field gets 
gets weak. But of course, that's a much shorter cycle. It's an 11 year cycle. So take those cycles and whatever other variables are playing into this and you put that all together and you're going to get something that looks pretty random in all likelihood. Yes. And the other bad news is that the impactor, the one that created the strewn fields, comes in during the excursion before the bottom. And that's where we are right now. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so pray we don't have any big comets headed our way in the next few years. Uh, it's been a great show. That's a boom. Find us tonight at 8 o'clock on Magnetic Reversal News. Indeed. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message.